Okay, so thank you everyone for, for joining us today as part of the TCD Neurosoc um, seminar series. Today we have a very interesting um, discussion on the neurology of COVID-19, including long COVID. And I am absolutely honored to be joined by fantastic speakers. Um, Dr. Michael Zandi, who trained in medicine at Cambridge for following his neurology training and a PhD at Cambridge University in biomarkers of neuropsychiatric lupus and MDN and MDR encephalitis. He is currently a consultant neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, Queen Square, London, and an honorary associate professor in the University College London, Queen Square Institute of Neurology, Department of Neuromuscular Disease. He runs an autoimmune encephalitis and neuroimmunology clinic and co-chairs the weekly UCL Queen Square National Hospital COVID-19 Neurology Encephalitis Meeting. We're also joined by Dr. Hadi Manji, who was appointed consultant neurologist at National Hospital in Queen Square, London in 1997. He studied medicine at Trinity Hall in Cambridge. His specialist interests are in neuroinfection, including HIV, tropical disorders, and now COVID-19, as well as peripheral nerve disorders. He's part of the MRC Center for Neuromuscular Disease at National Hospital. As he has taught and lectured in Kenya, Mozambique, Nigeria, and India, and he's a senior author and editor of the Oxford Handbook of Medicine. And we're also joined by Dr. Patricia McNamara, who graduated from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, obtained her PhD at Trinity College Dublin, examining the neuropsychological profile imaging and CSF features of HIV-related cognitive impairment. She has been a consultant at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery since October in the Autonomic Department and since July 2018 was also involved in general neurology at the Northwick Park Hospital. She's a co-chair of the Encephalitis and COVID-19 Neurology MTD along with Dr. Michael Zandi and Dr. Hadi Manji and Laura Benjamin. Thank you so much for, um, for being here today and taking the time out to, to speak to us and, and letting us know what's going on with the nervous system and COVID-19. So without further ado, please. Okay, thanks very much for that introduction, Kat. Um, so I'll just, can I share my slides um, to start off this talk? Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. It's all clear, good. Well, thanks very much for inviting us. I wish we could be in Dublin, in fact, um, today, but this is just the first slide. So this is Mike Zandi, myself and Patricia. This is Laura Benjamin. This is our group, the encephalitis group, which looks at patients with infections and, and um, immune mediated encephalitides. And we have a meeting every week to discuss such cases. So Bill Gates was prescient in 2015 when he said, if anything kills more than 10 million people in the next few decades, it's likely to be a infectious virus rather than war, not missiles, but microbes. And, and obviously in the last 18 months, his predictions have proved to be correct. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the background to set up the scene for Mike and, Lo and Patricia is about pandemics in general, particularly influenza and HIV. This condition called encephalitis lethargica, which was seen to be a consequence of the influenza pandemic, and then lead the background to SARS, MERS, and then COVID-19 for Mike and, and Patricia, really. All right. So, in fact, you know, Pandemics are not the exception, but the rule throughout history. So you had the plague, you had pandemics of syphilis with 50,000 people dying in, in, the, in 1494. And then you had the Spanish influenza pandemic of 1918, which killed about 50 million people. And all the subsequent influenza pandemics are all due to viruses, which are descendants of this particular virus. Now, some viruses have established a fairly uh, innocuous relationship with humans. So if you look at the herpes viruses, herpes simplex, which causes cold sores, or you look at herpes varicella zoster, which causes chicken pox or shingles, they have a fairly sort of innocuous uh, relationship 
But there are other viruses which are more adaptable, which have continued to cause havoc over the decades. So for example, this H1N1 swine flu pandemic of 2009 was, was a direct descendant of um, Spanish flu uh, virus of, 20, of 1918. And if you look at this chart, which, which really highlights infections, it's quite scary, actually. I think if I were you, I would not leave Dublin or London because of all these viruses which are lurking everywhere from Zika, Ebola, SARS, MERS, Nipah viruses. These are all, all in the offing, and these are all conditions that you know, we as doctors need to be aware of when we're seeing patients. So the 1918 influenza pandemic was the mother of all pandemics, literally. 500 million people were affected, about 3% of patients died with 50 million deaths. And as I've said, all the subsequent flu pandemics have resulted from this particular influenza virus. And the virus is now an enzoonosis amongst pigs with constant circulation between animals and humans which, with, with epidemics every so often. But on the whole, they are less pathogenic than the original 20, 1918 pandemic. And so they're circulating around and will continue to cause problems, which is what may happen with coronavirus, in fact. But anyway, more of that later. And if you look at this um, 1918 pandemic, what you'll see compared to the coronavirus pandemic, the age group affected was much lower. The people who died tended to be uh, less than 65 years old, usually in the 30s and 40s. So different um, epidemiology from the one we're seeing now with coronavirus 19. And then there was this complication, which you may have heard of, called encephalitis lethargica, which was felt to be a complication of that particular influenza pandemic. And although not necessarily applicable to the current situation, nevertheless, it is an indication that patients that we're seeing now maybe need to be followed up long term. And just as an introduction, some of you may have come up, may have seen this particular film called Awakenings with Robert De Niro and Robin Williams, which I'll pay you a little uh, excerpt of, of patients with Parkinsonian encephalitis lethargica. Does he ever speak to you? Of course not. Not in words. No change data 9-11-44. Your patients, doctor, haven't moved in decades. What I believe, what I know, is these people are alive inside. How do you know that, doctor? I know it. I just wanted to say to you, I preferred your explanation. At 200 milligrams, he showed no response. Maybe he needs more. Maybe this he is levodopa he was talking about, which is used for Parkinson's. It's there. It's a miracle. Put my glasses on my face. So that's just a, a demonstration of that post-encephalitic Parkinsonism and encephalitis lethargica. Does he have... How do I move on from this? Right. Now, the, the mechanism of this particular condition is not really entirely clear, but it may be that it is um, really related to an immune-mediated disorder post-infection. Uh, and Mike's certainly done some research on this particular topic. And it may be that we have to watch out for these sort of complications in the COVID patients. Then there's the HIV pandemic, which started in 1981. Now, most of you in the audience are probably weren't even born when this started. Um, and, but I was a houseman at this time in 1981. And these were the sort of adverts which were being played on the television which were very scary. This is the actor John Hurd. There is now a danger that has become a threat to us all. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure. The virus can be passed during sexual intercourse with an infected person. 
anyone can get it, man or woman. So far, it's been confined to small groups, but it's spreading. So protect yourself and read this leaflet when it arrives. If you ignore AIDS, it could be the death of you. So don't die of ignorance. It was a public information film. This was in 1982. It's now a date. And, and so in 2019, 38 million people living with HIV, uh, 1.7 million every year being diagnosed with the condition. And, and this was the Middlesex Hospital in 1982 where I was working. And you know, these were the days when Princess Diana would be shaking a patient's hand, would make the news uh, in the Daily Mirror of, some, of a patient with AIDS. That's how dramatic it all was in those days. And the complications were legendary with infections and also HIV itself causing problems of the brain. And then the treatment came on highly active antiretroviral therapy and everything changed. But you know, there are, one can learn from this sort of uh, pandemic. And so for example, if you compare HIV and COVID-19, one of the important things that has changed is behavior change of people. Um, Everyone's wearing masks, everyone's washing their hands. Uh, and so there is a behavior change in terms of uh, how one's dealing with this pandemic compared to HIV. And in fact, one could say that face masks are the condoms of the 21st century, really. Um, identification of high risk groups, so black, Asian minority groups, high risk compared to gay men or people who've had blood transfusions. Uh, and so there are parallels and, and things one can learn from all these uh, two pandemics. And if you look at the long-term complications, so brain disease and HIV can be long-term. We have to look at other complications from COVID-19. And there's also this long COVID, which Patricia will talk to you about. And in the news today, it says that 2 million people in the UK have long COVID. And the mechanism is not entirely clear. Then we come to the coronaviruses. So SARS uh, in 2003, MERS in 2009 were coronaviruses, epidemics rather than pandemics, but they did give us a clue as to what the effects of these viruses could be on, on the nervous system. So there were some publications early on in SARS in 2003, 2004, which showed that the brain and nervous system could be affected by this virus um, in terms of muscle disease, in terms of a condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome, and also in terms of, of strokes, which have been an important feature in the number of cases that we've been involved with and in, in our publication in, in the journal Brain, which Mike will go through with you. So the numbers were small, really, for, for SARS, it was about 9,000, MERS was about 3,000. Uh, so the, the numbers were not there compared to COVID-19. As of this morning, this is where we are with COVID-19. 179 million cases worldwide, nearly 4 million deaths. Uh, and now we've got the vaccine, obviously, which is a huge um, progress in, in, in managing this condition. So the numbers are really striking and going up all the time. And then just coming to coronavirus and the nervous system. So this was the first publication from Wuhan, which uh, documented that about 36% of patients had neurological complications. Now these are all sick patients in hospital and they had a number of neurological conditions, including stroke, impaired consciousness, headache, seizures, muscle pains, and what was not clear was whether these neurological complications were due to the virus itself, some sort of immune mechanism triggered off by the virus, or the fact that these are all very sick patients with sepsis, i.e. infection in the blood, low blood oxygen levels, or low blood pressures. Uh, and this was the, the, the platform that set up uh, our study in our encephalitis meeting um, which Mike will now talk about and talk about our experience. So I hope that sort of sets you a, a, a platform um, about what 
has been going on preceding the COVID. And so these are all the complications seen now in COVID, uh, which Mike will discuss, and on COVID symptoms. Uh, and apart from that, there are all these complications of patients who've been very sick in hospital, uh, on ICU, for example, um, in, in, this, in, in the last 15 months. So I'm going to finish there, Kat, and I'm going to pass on to Mike uh, to take you through now about the specific complications in COVID-19, uh, perhaps also be discussing how uh, we're trying to work out the mechanisms of this. And then, and then Patricia will then go on to long COVID. So over to you, Mike. Perfect, thank you very much. Great, thanks so much. Can you see my screen and um, hear me? Yeah, we can hear very well, we Perfect. can see the screen. So thanks, Hadi. So I'm one of another neurologist at Queen Square um, with Hadi and Patricia and Laura Benjamin, as we mentioned. And this is Queen Square in Bloomsbury in London. And uh, for the last four or five years, we had a, a monthly meeting with neurologists and virologists, infectious diseases doctors, also psychiatrists um, and people in the neuroimmunology lab and we'd meet and we'd discuss cases of brain, suspected brain inflammation, of which roughly half are due to infection of the brain, mainly viruses, uh, and half can be due to the immune system attacking the brain. And it was a pretty obscure meeting. You know, we'd be in a basement of this hospital, and we'd have about 20 or 30 people there um, every month. And we were talking about NMDA receptor encephalitis, which you mentioned earlier, you know, we were very interested in people who had inflammation in the brain who had psychiatric symptoms. And again, this is something that we're seeing in, in COVID as well, where you can have psychosis and hallucinations, but actually have a, an antibody or some inflammation in the, in the brain being the cause and the seat of those symptoms. And if you identify those patients, you can treat them treat their immune system, you can make their psychosis get better. And there's a very long history uh, going back to the 1960s of a lot of research being done um, in psychiatric hospitals that's led to our understanding of, of brain inflammation. So in the first wave of March 2020, we shut down the meeting because a lot of the um, junior doctors and fellows who are running the show were redeployed to go to the ITU or go to the wards to look after COVID and we thought that there'd be no interest really uh, in cases of, of obscure uh, brain inflammation but it was quite clear within a handful of weeks that there were lots of cases uh, cropping up particularly around London where we were focused on but across the country people who were in hospital if you remember that time with COVID you would have to be hospitalized to have a test for COVID and there were patients in the intensive care unit who are not waking up or people who are young, uh, they'd be a little bit hypoxic, but they'd be quite confused. They'd have a delirium beyond what you would normally expect um, with a pneumonia. And we started to get these patterns come through. So we were really well set up at the beginning with our infectious diseases doctors and neurologists to report quite quickly the detail of what was coming through. And as Hadi has said, there were, there were clear reports first from China and then as the virus spread uh, to Italy and France, um, initial reports of some common themes. So in our first series of around 40 patients or so, we thought we saw around four main patterns of how COVID was affecting the brain itself. So there was this first pattern where you could have low blood oxygen, you've come in with COVID, you've come into hospital. And of course, this, is, this study was biased towards people who were admitted to hospital because back in the first wave, you wouldn't get a test for COVID if you weren't admitted to hospital. So there are often younger people, they were in hospital and they were delirium. They had a delirium, they, had, they could have psychosis, they could be confused and we call this an encephalopathy. And by and large, you would see no definite signs of brain damage or injury on their brain scans. Or if we did a lumbar puncture, we wouldn't see signs of inflammation. Then we saw a group where we saw what we think is definite evidence of inflammation within the brain. And I'll show you some of the scans. And this looked more like the immune system attacking the brain than infection itself. When we tried to measure the virus in the spinal fluid, we didn't find it. 
And there have been very few reports of people saying actually the virus infects the brain cells uh, itself. And more commonly, we think we're seeing what we call para-infectious or the, or the consequence of infection leading to the immune system trying to clear the infection. It can then attack the brain. But there is something about COVID that it affects the blood vessels throughout the body, it can affect the skin. Um, and of course, blood vessels are very important in go, going to the brain. And we would see strokes. And these strokes um, could be quite severe in people with COVID, clogging up blood vessels. Blood clotting was really off the scale. And if somebody had a stroke and one of their large blood vessels was clotted up, you would thin the blood, but then another blood vessel will clot up and they could also have blood clots in the lungs. And there's something about this virus that seems to trigger a cascade with clotting. And I'll mention very briefly how that's been a, a small thing, but that has been observed with the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, for example. And then we saw a group of people where the, the nerves and the arms and legs were affected as well. And in fact, in retrospect now, we've seen fewer of these cases than one would expect. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then we've seen a, a collection of other unusual things, vision, the optic nerve, raised pressure within the brain, isolated seizures, psychiatric syndromes alone. And these are all of interest. And so this is a panel um, of brains. So this is one patient here. And this patient here has inflammation in the seat of the brain, in the evolutionarily oldest part of the brain, the limbic system. And they have features very much what we call a, a limbic encephalitis, which is an autoimmune type of brain inflammation where there's significant memory loss. Uh, there can be problems with emotion. Um, sometimes there can be compulsive behavior and seizures. And this is the kind of pattern that we've seen for decades with various autoantibodies. Here we have something and this is one patient here in these two panels where we have large areas of inflammation within the white matter, which we would call an acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or ADEM. And this was first described in the 1920s after the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic and has been known to be triggered by um, many viruses. But superimposed on that, if you can see within there, are some small black dots where there appears to be a super added blood vessel or blood reduced blood oxygen injury pattern also seen within these brains. And then this patient here has got necrosis of the deep parts of the brain, real tissue death as a result of the virus. And this and maybe infection of the brain is involved there. Thankfully, these have remained quite rare. This is a patient who had severe inflammation of the brain, but they had very, whereas the, one of the former patients was in the intensive care unit and very sick with very bad involvement of their lungs with COVID, this person had very trivial COVID. They, they didn't need to go to hospital. They, had, they were almost asymptomatic from their lung infection. But then they had severe headache, paralysis down one side, and you can see there was swelling and inflammation on the right-hand side of the brain. And because the skull is fixed, there's nowhere for this swelling to go. So they started to compress the deep parts of their brain and become comatose. And they, and they would nearly have died. And what they needed was an operation to remove part of the skull to allow the brain uh, to expand out. And we treated the inflammation with steroids and other immune drugs. A biopsy of that tissue shows inflammatory cells that have infiltrated. There was no sign of uh, infection. And that's a severe form of ADEM. Again, and these are a collection of panels of, for example, large vessel strokes causing brain damage here. Here who had viral pneumonia, this is their chest CT scan and had a curious pattern of small punctate hemorrhages within their brain, which we call micro hemorrhages. And you need a special form of MRI, susceptibility weighted MRI to see these. And they just had a, a seizure. And sometimes patients can have very mild symptoms and have this phenomenon. 
Guillain-Barre syndrome, where you can get inflammation of the peripheral nerves triggered by a virus, and this has been seen due to uh, many viruses and bacteria. And there's been closely, for example, one recent example of uh, an illness causing this is the Zika. Uh, but in fact, although we saw clusters of this, and we think this could well be caused by COVID, we saw a cluster of these patients who had COVID and then Guillain-Barre syndrome with no other cause, we haven't been inundated, given those large numbers of people who've had COVID, our hospitals haven't been inundated with people with brain inflammation or with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And in fact, in this paper, which is now published in Brain, we've seen fewer cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome in the last year than we had in previous years. But there could be confounds here. There's been social distancing, there's less eating out, and there are many other uh, bacteria and organisms that have been suppressed due to the change in human behavior, which may explain the lower rate of Guillain-Barre syndrome in the last year. And perhaps without COVID, we would hardly have seen Guillain-Barre at all, similar to how influenza was suppressed in last winter. So there's an intuitive link here between COVID and nerve inflammation. And again, we've seen reports of brain of nerve inflammation due to inflammation of the blood vessels going to the nerves, that's called vasculitis. Now, by and large, and Patricia will talk about what we're really seeing in the aftermath of COVID, people who've had COVID and neurological symptoms and they still have them after a month, or well, they still have impairment of quality of life after a month or three months, that's long COVID. By and large, we're not seeing those patterns that I've shown you. But it, it, one of the questions remains, are we going to see after a delay encephalitis lethargica, encephalitis lethargica again, are we going to see Parkinson's disease, dementia? And there are some papers with headlines that COVID is associated with an increased risk of dementia. There was one study from colleagues in Oxford looking at American healthcare records, 40,000 cases of COVID. And there was a substantial increase in the risk of perhaps uh, an odds ratio of two of dementia compared to uh, influenza in previous years. But we have to be careful in how we interpret some of that uh, information. Again, COVID is a serious illness and it's putting many people through a, a significant physical insult that perhaps can reveal a dementia in a person who would have gone on to, to manifest their symptoms of dementia over the next couple of years. So maybe going through COVID is like running a marathon and it just shows you vulnerabilities and brings to the fore diagnoses that would have come uh, apparent anyway. A further study that we've done published recently in Brain Communications led by Laura Benjamin Ross Patterson is to look at the spinal fluid in patients who've had COVID. And in this study, we looked at people who are in hospital with bad COVID, essentially those, the patients that I showed you in the first paper, and compared them to people that didn't have neurological problems and also people who uh, didn't have COVID. Now, here we saw some pattern of brain injury in the spinal fluid, the protein neurofilament light, which is a protein that, if released, tells you that there's been some neuronal injury. And in fact, now we can start to measure this in the blood as well. And you may have read that this has been used in Alzheimer's disease and in other, other conditions, mainly as a research basis to try to see if there is brain injury. This is a protein that's specific to the brain. And we did see in the spinal fluid that this is increased in those patients that I've shown you who tended to have abnormal imaging and have very significant um, and serious problems. The study that remains to be done is to look over time and see if this is the case in people who have thinking problems or other problems after COVID, but we haven't seen that. Um, and there are some studies that show some atrophy after COVID, but a lot of those studies, again, are really showing perhaps changes in plasticity and maybe they're not really showing brain injury. So by and large, we want to you know, tell patients and people who've had COVID that we've not been seeing significant rates of brain damage and brain injury like we saw 100 years ago. But there are concerns, there are signals here, and, and clearly 
trying to suppress COVID is, is the key thing to do uh, and prevent COVID infection is the key thing to do. I'll just mention very something about the virus that triggers blood clotting. You'll all be familiar now that this has been seen very rarely after the AstraZeneca vaccine. And this is an immune problem, antibodies to a platelet factor that lead the platelets to drop in the blood, which is paradoxically causes blood clots. And that was the mechanism found um, by a colleague in UCL, Marie Scully and colleagues. And another colleague in UCL, David Waring and others have shown that ischemic stroke itself can be due to this mechanism, but is very, very rare and much rarer than the rates that we get with natural COVID infection. The neuropathology of COVID is poorly understood. There have been few studies of that, mainly injury of blood vessels. These are people who died of severe COVID. They're in the intensive care unit. They had large vessel strokes. But you do see some changes in the immune system. You see the innate immune system is activated a little bit. And we know in this case series from Marcus Glatzel and colleagues in Germany, the virus can infect the autonomic nerves and it's got some very interesting patterns of infection, but we're seeing virus within the blood vessels, but there is some increase in inflammation in areas of the brain that we need to study more. And so this is a schematic of how can we understand how COVID affects the nervous system? Well, there is direct brain uh, invasion and infection itself, maybe through the blood vessels. There is the post-infectious immune mediated injury, which we've certainly seen a lot more of. There is a peripheral nerve and muscle injury, which may also be due to metabolic system or infection. But you have to remember too, that the nervous system, you can have neurological symptoms due to systemic disease. If you've got pneumonia, you've got inflammation in the body that can give you um, neurological symptoms, weakness, numbness, memory problems. And some exciting research is looking at various mechanisms of how could the virus cause damage. And this is one study from the States looking at brain organoids where there is potential for the virus to infect brain cells. We know it can do it through the ACE uh, receptor. And often these viruses induce an inflammatory response within the body, a type one interferon. Group showed that this wasn't seen in COVID, but what you would see is that an infected brain cell would alter the way that the adjacent brain cells could handle oxygen. And of course, that may be one way um, that there is injury. So really what we need is good uh, research to try to follow up everybody who's had COVID and has had neurological complications. And the research lags what's going on in the real world. So this, uh, and with funding and organization. So the one study that we're part of and is set up is the COVID CNS study, looking at people who are hospitalized with COVID and starting to look at biomarkers, brain imaging and longitudinally follow them up. But studies are, are starting in, uh, in long COVID. And with that, I'll pass you over to uh, Patricia. I hope you can see my screen. Um, so thank you for inviting us to talk. Oh, well, don't know what it's doing. Um, so I'm just going to focus on the neurological sequelae after COVID infection. So um, my screen is uh, flashing. So hopefully you're just seeing one image. Apologies. Uh, yeah. So we set up a intro slide. Thank you. Sorry, Kat. No, I was just saying that we can see your screen very well. It's oh, okay. perfect. Thank you. So obviously, we, as Mike and Heidi said, we had set up the COVID MDT, but then we also set up a neurology COVID clinic for patients who had neurological complications after COVID. So that was started in November. But we haven't seen patients on an ad hoc basis before that, but officially that funding in November. So we've been seeing them every week in clinic. So... There have been lots of papers obviously published about COVID, so there are hundreds and hundreds of papers and there are new um, We still don't really know why people 
have persistent symptoms after COVID. Let's skip the slide. Um, and I suppose you have symptoms that persist for more than 12 weeks. And it was initially, I suppose, uh, pursued by patients who initially, you know, described they had ongoing symptoms. And obviously initially in patients who were acutely unwell and who were in hospital and trying to manage them after hospitalization. And there was probably less focus on patients who had been at home with milder infections, but were now continuing to complain of ongoing symptoms and who weren't able to return to work. So it was really led by patients initially who um, you know, focused on the fact that they had continuing symptoms and they weren't getting better and weren't able to return to their normal activities. And so there have been lots of papers published that we just go through, some of them including, as Hattie mentioned earlier on today, one that was published earlier today by Imperial. So they looked at over half a million adults. So they estimate that approximately by 2 million adults or 2 million people in the UK will have post-COVID symptoms. So symptoms that persist past 12 weeks. So that's having at least one symptom that persists. And that can be fatigue or persistent loss of smell or taste or chronic symptoms. So obviously can be a, or maybe ongoing chest pain or shortness of breath. And they have quite a variety of symptoms. So this is a study from Oxford, which um, Mike mentioned as well. So they looked back at over 200,000 patients who've been diagnosed with COVID and they looked at new neurological or psychiatric diagnoses anxiety. Um, I think the headline, as Mike said, had focused on the fact that they had an increased risk for These patients have been admitted to ICU. Um, some of them have been quite unwell. There's a quite an age range, so you've got to bear in mind that there isn't a causative relationship. We haven't seen a definite increased risk of dementia in people attending clinic. Most patients have cognitive symptoms that slowly improve, but it can be very slow over months or a year or more. So it's quite frustrating for patients. But they had tried to match it with an influenza and other respiratory tract infections to try to show the difference between COVID and other infections. And then this is a paper from the US from a neurology COVID clinic they set up there in the first 100 patients that they saw. And again, similar to our patients, so the common symptoms were brain fog, headache, sensory disturbance, ongoing animality and taste and smell, and then myalgia. And obviously this was run up until November of last year. So that time point, you know, there hadn't been any definite improvement over the six months and they continue to have impaired quality of life in their cognitive and fatigue domains. And we're continuing to have constant that, that impact is on their everyday life. And then this is one that came out in uh, May, I think. A meta-analysis of a number of papers. So they had over 50 papers that they reviewed. And again, they looked at predominantly neurology and psychiatric symptoms. And they looked to see what's the difference between you know, people who had symptoms for a shorter period of time versus more than 12 weeks. Um, and there's no correlation particularly between the symptoms and severity. So most of the patients we see in the post-COVID clinic were not admitted to hospital who have these ongoing symptoms. They had mild illnesses, they were at home, or they had very brief hospital admissions. They were not the patients who were admitted to ICU. Um, so the, in this study, again, they showed there wasn't any improvement within the first six months of these ongoing symptoms. So the patients that we're seeing... Predominantly, the commonest phenotypes are patients presenting with new onset of headache, so persistent daily headaches, new onset of migraineous headaches, um, sensory disturbance of people complaining of pins and needles or numbness. That's migratory. It's not necessarily in a neuropathic distribution. Um, and that, again, slowly seems to improve over time. We have a small number of patients who have um, a neuropathy and a small fibro neuropathy, so they get burning or pain in their hands and feet. The majority of patients just are migrated, so they may affect an arm one day and the leg another day, and they vary in intensity and they often have what we call like attentional cognitive symptoms. So they have difficulty making memories in that they aren't fully attending. So they can only remember a part and then only retrieve that part that they've actually made the memory for. They might go into a room and forget what they've gone in for. They find one's names, they find it hard to focus or concentrate. 
perhaps people perhaps who are very avid readers beforehand find it difficult to get through a book or to continue reading because they can't keep the plot in their head. Um, I'm a patient who composed music and when he was reading a while could only compose music for five minutes, but over time has been able to get back to composing it for three to four hours at a time again. And then another group of patients have autonomic symptoms. So they get lots of dizziness, palpitations, um, they feel really high heart rates, particularly with exercise. So when they stand up or walk or try to do any exercise, they get really high heart rates. And all these people have been very active, very fit beforehand. So people who cycled hundreds of kilometers in a week or who did triathlons or who went to the gym regularly, who normally would have resting heart rates in the 50s or 60s are finding they have a resting heart rate in the 90s. And if they try to do anything, it goes up to between 120 up to 180 or 200 at times. And it makes them feel really tired, really unwell. It also gives them like an organic anxiety and they feel quite anxious around it as well. And then we have some patients who have tremor. We also have some patients who have persistent anosmia and agusia. And some of those patients have found smell training helpful. So those websites have been helpful. They, the, the theory is that, you know, if they try to re-stimulate, so they use smells like vanilla or rose or mint, kind of strong, sense and that they try to do these regularly for a number of weeks to try to help with improving smell and taste but again this can last for quite a number of months after COVID. And then we've had some patients as well who've had functional neurological disorder so patients who present with functional weakness or functional tremor or a gait disturbance that is functional that's not due to any structural cause but because these patients have had quite a lot of anxiety around their illness so in the first wave when people were told to stay at home, they were told not to come to hospital. A lot of people were very unwell at home, so they were very short of breath. They felt absolutely terrified that they were going to die at home by themselves. Um, and for people who were in hospital then, a lot of them you know, witnessed other people in their ward who were very unwell, who passed away, so they may go to sleep and wake up in the morning and you know, somebody's no longer there. So they also have higher rates of anxiety and depression, and they often describe flashbacks as well. So that can manifest and physically and give people functional neurological symptoms as well. So this is one of the patients who has postural tachycardia. So as I was saying, some people get these high heart rates when they stand up or try to do any exercise. So this is a patient who's in her 40s, female patient who hasn't been able to return to work because every time she tries to stand up or bend or stoop or walk more than a few meters, gets really high heart rates. As you can see here, this is her heart rate and it peaks up and down constantly throughout the day. Blood pressure is, you know, relatively normal throughout the day and just has its normal variations. But this is limiting her ability to return to work along with her fatigue. And this is what happens sometimes. So then we can do testing to look at the autonomic nerves and how well they're working. And most people after COVID, the nerves themselves are working well. So they can, they can regulate blood pressure and heart rate unless they get orthostatic stresses. So when they have to stand up or stand still for a while or try to exercise, and then they get these really high heart rates. And what we do here is to look at that, it's to tilt people up. So it tilted at 60 degrees, and their heart rate stays okay, and then they're tilted up and it goes up pretty high, and then it comes down again once they're placed back to supine and they can rest with, with gravity, not having as much of an impact. And this often occurs with people who are bendy or flexible, so they get pooling. So if somebody when they're when they're lying supine, this is their legs, and when they're seated or standing, so they get these color changes because of the vascular elasticity. Uh, and we see this in, you know, we've seen this before COVID and we know that it can happen with viruses previously as well. But there's certainly something about COVID that seems to have made this much more common. So in our clinic, probably 20% of people attending the clinic would complain of these symptoms. And we've tested quite a lot of patients and probably about a third of patients have abnormalities on their testing. Um, not everyone will meet all the criteria. So some people just feel really dizzy and lightheaded are perhaps more aware or more vigilant of their heart rate, but don't actually meet all the criteria for the full diagnosis. A lot of the management is trying to help people very slowly build up their level of exercise, making sure they're well hydrated, adding salt to their diet, um, particularly within the group of patients, cardiac investigations as well, to ensure they have a normal heart rhythm, up to evidence of myocarditis 
on MRI after COVID as well. So they have to try to do a very slow greater return to exercise. So they try to limit their heart rate going up too much. And that can often be achieved with medications such as beta blockers or evaporating, which will lower their heart rate and allow them to build up their exercise tolerance. So they're using the short term, they're not necessarily meant to be long-term medications, but to try to allow them to build up their exercise without causing too much stress to them. And then fainting as well. So this is just a patient who fainted when they were on a tilt table test. So again, their blood pressure goes down, they return to supine and their blood pressure restores. So um, we said that patients would benefit from having a dedicated clinic. Otherwise, the patients are all being sent to different neurologists. So the, I guess the benefit of coming to one clinic is that you see neurologists who get to see lots of patients who've had COVID, who can recognise the patterns. And also patients are reassured when you've seen other patients with COVID. Because a lot of patients feel that they perhaps have been ignored or their symptoms are being downplayed. And these are, you know, mostly people in their 20s, 30s and 40s who are normally fit and well. It's really hard to get back to their full life and do everything that they want to do. And new headaches if they have that are not improving over time, they would benefit from it. Having detailed neuropsychology testing to look at what we call attention, so it's often affected also by their their fatigue and their other symptoms are all taking a toll on them. And then we decide the patients who need to have than the number of days that they have headache because migraine in and of itself will also cause brain fog or cognitive pain in the sensory symptoms again with medications you can help with strategies to manage their focusing on doing one task at a time having pacing so they're not doing lots of things the one throughout the day they're trying to do one or two do things to help improve their attention and concentration and then talking them through all their symptoms and obviously being able to access other specialist services as well. So the patients have found that it's helpful. Um, obviously, it's only available to the patients within our catchment area. So other patients are seen by different services throughout the country. But we found it helpful for our patient group. Um, and that's just a quick run through patients after COVID. And thank you for your attention. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so now, uh, if you if anyone has any questions, please um, send them into the chat, and I will just pause the recording. Um,